We are good to go. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. For the, I'm so pleased with this wonderful turnout. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. My name is Benjamin Bernstein, and I'm here to lecture to you on the astrology of 2012. And uh, tonight's format is a little bit unusual. So most of you may have noticed that we're doing a 90-minute lecture and then a 30-minute experiential piece. And the 30-minute experiential piece will be guided invocations. We will have a brief uh, intermission between the two, so if you don't want to stay for that, you're welcome to go. But I think if you stay, I think it's the most valuable part of the whole evening, personally. Okay, so let me uh, begin by uh, telling you why am I qualified to be talking about this. I'm going to just adjust this slightly for myself. Okay, I, my company is called It's All Good Astrology, although within the next few months it will change names and be called Astro Shaman. And the website will be astroshaman.com. But right now it's still it's all goodastrology.com uh, and shamanic healing. <laughs> uh, I host a podcast called This Week in Astrology. Has anyone heard that by any chance? Yeah, cool. Um, it uh, is one of the top rated astrology podcasts on iTunes, and it's a free download. If you ever wanted to go check out This Week in Astrology, uh, there's been. I'm sorry? Bones. Bones, thank you, thank you. Uh, if you, would you please check your cell phones or any, anything that makes noise, and please, if you can stand to, just turn it off entirely, and if you just can't stand to, at least vibrate it. <laughs> I mean, if you're a doctor on call, vibrate it, you know, that kind of thing. Thank you for that. Thank you for the reminder, Nicole. And I'd like to give a big thank you to Nicole, who is my girl Friday tonight, and she's helping me so much. Thank you so much, Nicole. Yay, Nicole. <laughs> Okay, uh, anyhow, the podcast that's, I'm up to, I think, episode number 245, I've done it every week for several years, and that's, if you want to learn astrology, it's a really fun way to do it, if you just download the show. Um, I have lectured at three national astrology conferences, I write the monthly column for Natural Awakenings, although we took a vacation in January, it should be back next month as usual, and have worked uh, with over 3,500 clients around the world, so... That's why I'm qualified to talk about astrology. There is no credentialing officially for astrologers. Anyone can say they're an astrologer, so make sure you get one who's reputable. <laughs> <laughs> there is gonna be a prize at the end of the night. After we finish the guided invocations, I'm gonna give away a free 90-minute session with me. And you can do astrology, you can do guided invocations, you can do shamanic healing, or any combination thereof. That's what those little white slips are for. So if you'll put your name and email on those, uh, in a while, the basket's going to go around, and you can put them in at that point. And at the end of that, I will draw one, and uh, someone's going to win a consultation. Yay! Uh, the CDs is a CD I did uh, quite a few years ago. It's all instrumental, synthesized, meditative kind of music. So this is with my compliments, and I hope you enjoy that. All right, uh, and if you put your name and email on the, on the slip, then that also signs you up for my free weekly newsletter. Uh, which goes out every week. It has the next week's general astrology forecast, also articles on astrology and guided invocations and spiritual stuff. And if you ever get tired of it, a single click on the unsubscribe button will take it away forever. So, um, but uh, this is how I build my mailing list and I like to give as good as I get. All right, um, and again, we'll do that drawing after the invocations at the end. So let's get into the meat of the content and feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, if it's a question on the actual content of the lecture, I'll be happy to answer it. If it's just like a general astrology question, I may defer it to private afterwards because we have a lot, of, lot to cover in 90 minutes of the astrology part. A lot going on this year. So what is going on in the world these days? We have economic uncertainty, recession, natural disasters, global warming, nuclear meltdowns, Middle East upheaval, Eurozone turmoil, debt crisis, and Occupy Wall Street. Other than that, it's business as usual. <laughs> a little bit more turmoil than usual, would you say? We have the Tea Party, we have the end, quote unquote, of the Mayan calendar, and so much more. Actually, astrologically, now, for those of us who aren't, uh, who don't have a whole bunch of years on us, it's the most turbulent time of our lives. Okay? The best response to this is to awaken. Yeah. <laughs> And I'll be getting more into that as we get into the theme. There is a strong spiritual metaphysical content in this lecture. You can leave now if that's not to your taste. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, but the future is really all call, our call rather. 
Um, to me, a less helpful question is, what fate do the planets have in store for us? That's sort of a fatalistic, deterministic vibe. A more helpful question is, how can we consciously partner with the planets to co-create the reality which serves everyone's highest need? Something we're going to be doing during the lecture tonight is shamanic astrology. We're going to actually invoke several planets into ourselves. And you're going to actually experience what that's like energetically. Okay? And again, if you don't want to do that, you can ask to be excluded and nothing will happen. So nothing is coerced here tonight. Uh, a word about the planets too. Welcome, come in. Uh, the planets, the way I think of them, are like the hands of a clock. Now, you can look at the clock and it might say right now that it's 710, but you know, actually that clock did not force that time to be there. It just measured the time. In the same way of thinking, the planets measure the energetic shifts on the planet, but they don't cause them. That is my, now there's no way to prove either way they do or don't cause something, but for those who say, oh, the planet's too far away, there's not enough energy coming off it to make a difference, you know, it's a synchronicity thing. The planets are just the hands of the clock showing us, okay, when Uranus and Pluto come to square, it's big shake-up time. And they are just showing us, okay, it's time for that on the planet, and the energy's there, and the planets just say, okay, that we told you, see? <laughs> If you want to really uh, read the best book out there on how the planetary movement affects the world at large, there's a book called Cosmos and Psyche, P-S-Y-C-H-E, by Richard Tarnas, T-A-R-N-A-S, the definitive book on mundane astrology. Mundane astrology doesn't mean boring, I hope. It just means <laughs> of the world at large, okay? Um, so again, we will be invoking some outer planets tonight. And just as with the divine energy in general, they're delighted to partner with us and assist us, but we have to ask. We'll get more into that in the experiential part. Okay, let's start by talking about the planet Uranus, the planet that can be pronounced three different ways, but the other two are scatological, so I don't. <laughs> it's the planet of uncertainty, and no one even quite knows how to pronounce it. It's so perfect, you know? <laughs> So the, the key themes that we're going to talk about tonight that relate to Uranus are humanitarian, revolutionary, the genius, individualist, paradigm shift, rebellion, shock, and awakening. And this is the astrological symbol, and that's the actual planet, sort of. Okay? So the big news with Uranus is that in 2010, it came into the sign of Aries, the first sign of the zodiac, of the 12. All right? And it only does that about every 84 years, so it's kind of a big deal. So the energy of this is the pioneering of new beginnings, because Aries is about the warrior, the pioneer, get out there, start something new, I have no patience, let's do it now, kind of energy, right? I'm sure you don't know anyone like that. Um, and because Uranus and Aries together are about boldly embracing innovation, technology, and revolution, it's a very exciting time. Um, now on the dark side, and let me just speak to this, astrology energies are neither inherently good or bad. It's just energy. Energy can be used to do very life-affirming things. Energy can be used to be used very destructive things. So the way I do astrology with clients, for example, is not to say, I'm so sorry, you're so screwed. <laughs> <laughs> Go to your cave for two years, you know. <laughs> it's not like that. There's nothing inherently bad. Even if you have Pluto on your sun, oh good, embrace the transformation. It's time, right? So it's all about intelligently using the raw material and co-creating your reality with the planetary forces. It's not a deterministic thing at all, in my opinion. Okay, so that's how I use astrology. I'm an educator more than a predictor when I work with clients. Okay, now a dark side manifestation of Uranus and Aries could be radical, dangerous leaders doing radical things. And we're seeing a little bit of that out in the world right now. We always have. But it gets a little stronger with Uranus and Aries. Okay, but again, we can all take it to the high side, pioneer new beginnings, you know, revolutionary get out and make it happen kind of energy. Occupy Wall Street is a very Uranus and Aries thing, among its other attributes. So the future is really ours to make in this scenario. Okay, now I always like to look historically. What happened the last time this astrological event occurred? The last time Uranus came into Aries was 1927-28 when it actually came in, and it was a revolutionary time. The first talking motion picture of the jazz singer came out the first successful TV transmission, the first color motion pictures, and Charles Lindbergh flew all the way to Paris, the first time an airplane had made that transcontinental flight. So you get the idea maybe Uranus is about technology? It is, that's one of its key meanings, you, you, you know, science, technology. So Uranus new beginnings, so we tend to see when Uranus comes to Aries, big technological breakthroughs. 
The time before that, 84 years prior, they had the first experimental telegraph lines running in the United States. Again, a, a revolutionary. Can you imagine not being able to uh, telegraph when there was only you know, written mail before that? That's amazing. It's like the email of the day, you know? <laughs> so, er, so, and we're already seeing revolutionary breakthroughs. You know, all the technology just goes faster and faster now. So that's part of what happens when Uranus comes into Aries. Now, next we're going to talk about Pluto, because Uranus and Pluto are doing a dance now. So Pluto has more keywords. Transformation, sex, death and rebirth, truth-seeking, transpersonal power, oligarchy, secret societies, <laughs> and wealth. Okay? So again, neither inherently good or bad, a lot of this, but it can run dark or light. Now, Pluto, I like to describe by metaphor. It operates slowly and relentlessly. <laughs> An astrologer named Rick Levine, who's very good, had a wonderful phrase for Pluto. He says, it's a tsunami moving at the speed of a glacier. <laughs> I'm going to take my time to make this big change. <laughs> uh, other Pluto phrases are like a phoenix burning to ash and resurrecting, a snake shedding its skin, a caterpillar morphing into a butterfly. Okay, and I like that last one because butterflies are pretty, you know? So it's a very optimistic vision. Okay, and what's Pluto up to in sign? It came into Capricorn not long ago, okay? Now, the last time it was in Capricorn was a pretty big deal, okay? Uh, that was 1762 to 1778. We had the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence. We had James Watt perfecting the steam engine, which launched the whole Industrial Revolution, which utterly transformed the world, okay? So, new structures. Pluto, transformation, Capricorn of the fundamental structures. And we're seeing that again now. Okay, Pluto came into Capricorn back in 2008. It'll be there through 2024, slow mover. Pluto takes like about 250 years to run around the whole zodiac, slow, slow planet. Um, so revolutionary changes, that's the Pluto part to the existing world order. Capricorn, well, let's think. Well, I'll give examples here in a moment. I don't want to jump the gun. Uh, but it's also about plutocratic control, right? Big Brother's watching you. Uh, the new air, you know, airport scanners that can see your whole body now, uh, cameras everywhere watching you, privacy becoming an antiquated concept, um, all that is part of it too. Okay, but it's also about reform. I mean, Obama, God bless him, when he got in, was able to get in some reform in healthcare and financial and energy stuff, as, to the degree that he could, with the Republican Congress. Um, but again, it's about a, a destruction of the old structures too. And we nearly had the whole financial structure go down, didn't we? <laughs> the year Pluto came into Capricorn, right? Okay, and I'm not entirely convinced it's not going to go down for real, but we'll see. <laughs> I'm not an economist, so I can't predict these things. Um, so what are these guys doing? Uranus and Pluto are making what's called a square, and that's a 90-degree angle. And it shows up this way in an astrology chart. Here's Uranus, here's Pluto, and that big, thick red line is a 90-degree angle called a square. Okay. So what do you get when you get these two planets doing this? You get potential challenges in all walks of life, social, political, economic, um, but it all is serving the function to catalyze evolution. Okay? It, only, it only breaks down and destroys the stuff that's outlived its usefulness. Okay? These are intelligent factors here. They're not just randomly bulldozing everything. All right? Everything in the universe is intelligent, and, and all this plays out for a reason. But the old forces of the old status quo tend to resist it, don't they? And that's playing out so beautifully in the current American Congress. It's like, no matter what is proposed, the Republicans say no. You know, it's like, it's like they're, you know, I'm a Democrat, I'll admit it. I try not to be too partisan in my lectures. But you can see this, you know, Obama desire, let's make some positive change, let's transform things. They say no, 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 no. It's like they're being the, uh, the Saturn part, I'm not going to change a thing. And, He's trying to be Uranus, bringing in some revolutionary change. Um, so you get, um, and that's typically when the old structure is about to go down, you know, it typically fights to the last gasp. and say, oh, you're right, I'll just step aside. <laughs> no, it'll, ah, to the last breath. <laughs> oh, from the depths of hell, I spin at thee, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan, all right. <laughs> Anyhow, you got resistance and upheaval, dramatic advances, and it exposes the unconscious forces that limit progress. The other thing about Pluto in, in a sign is it brings up all the dirt. Okay, so since Pluto came into Capricorn, what do we have now? The 99% and the 1%. Okay, we, we have seen 
the exposés around what happened with the financial crisis. We've seen the horrific things that happened in the financial sector that led to the whole meltdown with the mortgage instruments and all that. Um, we're seeing the corruption underlying government and, and big business. Back when Pluto was in Sagittarius, the time before that, we had all the scandals around the Catholic Church and all the child abuse going on there. We had these big megachurch preachers falling because of the very sins they were preaching against. You know, Pluto says, okay, I got the dirt on you, and I'm going to bring it up. Pluto, Lord of the Underworld. I got you. Here it is. <laughs> so wherever Pluto goes, the dirt comes up. Kind of how it works. Okay, so there's that square again. So we get a progressive evolution uh, factor here. Uh, Pluto and Capricorn is power, how it's consolidated and abused. Corporate and patriarchal influence and wealth um, are the factors that get exposed there. Uranus and Aries is about reform, living sustainably, revolutionizing, and living differently. Uh, so when you put them together, you get restless change. Uh, again, the energetic uh, duration of the square, it started back in 2008 when they, were, they weren't exact yet, but they were close enough to really turn on. Um, and they're going to be close enough to factor through 2018. So like an 11-year period. Um, the peak years start this year, 2012. And um, what's going to happen 2012 through 2015, these guys are going to make a square exactly seven times. Exact, seven times they're going to be exactly to 9 degree angles. Now, in my observations, that doesn't mean some amazing thing is going to happen the day they make a square. In reality, the way astrology works is the outer planets set the stage, and as long as they're near enough, we've got the core energy waiting to be activated. But it's actually the quicker guys who come around and like make conjunction to those planets that tend to time the events, if you want to get into that level of it. I'm less of a timer, and I'm more, okay, here's the general trend. Let's just adopt a general philosophy of working with this time period, and I think that's a whole lot more easy than trying to micro-time everything, which is not my style anyway. But anyhow, it's the most volatile astrology since the 60s, when Uranus and Pluto were conjunct in the 1960s. That's what made that decade so crazy, all right? So what happens when you have Uranus and Pluto come together so strongly? And in fact, this is the most powerful contact Uranus and Pluto have made since the 60s, because they move so slowly, it takes a long time for them to make one of those significant angles, all right? So we get frequently destructive upheaval, think Arab Spring, right? Uh, revolution and rebellion, hang on a second, intensified artistic and intellectual creativity, <coughs> rapid technological advance and innovation. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, about the square. Yeah? When they're conjunct, they're uh, both in the same sign. Right, they're both in the same place, same sign. When they're opposite, they're like both of each other? Opposition would be 180 degrees right across the circle. The how does the square affect it? How are they? Uh, 90 degrees, yeah. That means, how, is it that means you're, the, the English phrases that correlate, I'm turning a corner, challenge for growth, um, dynamic energy, and often there's a lot of conflict built into it. Okay. Can, be, can be managed well. A square, once in, in natal charts, for example, when a square is managed well, it can become the most powerful thing in the whole chart for you and the most positive. But usually you have to meet its challenges first and master the difficult energies of it, and when you become the master of those energies, then you become like a powerhouse. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, societies in general don't tend to be that wise, typically. <laughs> they have to be dragged along in the tough part, usually, before they get to the revelation. Now, what happened the last time we had a Uranus-Pluto square? That was late 1920s through most of the 1930s, the exact years of the Great Depression. Okay? So uh, that doesn't mean we're going to have a depression this time necessarily. But, I mean, we nearly had one. I mean, technically we're out of recession, but we still have this massive unemployment. So any time Uranus and Pluto square, there tends to be difficulty in the job sector and in the economy. And it's no different this time, is it? Okay. Let's look at what happened the last time Uranus and Pluto were in a big conjunction, though. This was 1961 to 1970 when it was really big. Of course, most of us have a sense of what happened in the 60s, right? Okay. Uh, civil rights movement, feminist movement, anti-war movement, all that was pretty well known. Um, but in other countries, it was a global phenomenon. We had 32 African countries gaining independence. We had the Cultural Revolution in China, a very horrific event, but a big change from what they had before. Um, Eastern European countries were demonstrating against communism. We had Arab-Israeli conflicts really coming into highlight. We, had, we nearly had a global nuclear catastrophe with the Bay of Pigs Cuban Missile Crisis. Very, very volatile time. Uranus and Pluto in strong contact. That's how they, they play. Again, if you read Cosmos and Psyche, he traces it back all the way through recorded history and shows you time after time after time after time what happens when these two guys line up with each other. It's pretty amazing. 
Um, so look at what the radical shift. 1959, we have clean cut Dick Clark on American Bandstand. 1969, we have a woman with her face painted with the American flag. You know? <laughs> Pretty dramatic contrast. Um, so again, while this is in effect 2008 through 2018, the key themes which we're going to go into more detail on slide by slide is dominant power structures collapsing, climate crises, disasters and catastrophes, technological explosion, economic instability, paradigm shifts, and into the unknown. Uranus Pluto Square, the final frontier. <laughs> All right, what about dominant power structures collapsing? All right. Okay, before it was about, you know, you, to be powerful you had to be white, male, wealthy, Christian, and heterosexual, right? Now, new groups demanding equality, gay, lesbian, bi, trans, Hispanics, immigrants, non-Christian, seniors, etc. Other groups are coming up and demanding their share of the power and the, and the energy. Big demographic shifts, a lot of people moving around the planet, uh, overpopulation, of course. We, we passed seven billion recently in human population. That's a pretty amazing number. The whole um, occupied 99% versus 1% is really coming into light. Um, again, the reforms I mentioned, healthcare, tax, finance, um, immigration is a larger and larger factor. Um, again, uh, it used to be unthinkable to have gay marriage. Now we have it in legal in several states and it'll probably go national before too long. Um, and even the political parties are changing. The Republicans don't look like they looked 10 years ago. The Tea Party has made a really big difference in their whole philosophy. They've gone radically rightward. Okay? So we see old structures really changing and transforming before our eyes. Climate crisis, of course, we know about global warming. Interesting how it's not in the news so much anymore. That's an interesting phenomenon. But again, uh, we have really wonderful possibilities with solar, wind, geothermal. Um, we have to, you know, we all are familiar with the litany of issues that we've got with here. But again, the whole possibility of this making a new jump into a new level of mainstream is possible with Uranus Pluto Square, as the old oil companies who traditionally fought that and say we're going to make our profit to the last drop even if we have to choke on our smog, you know, that can shift now under this energy. Um, again, Uranus Pluto Square times tend to be marked by increased disasters and catastrophes natural and man-made. And again, recently, the last couple of years, we had the tsunami in Japan and the and triple meltdown at the Fukushima plant. We had huge flooding in Pakistan, the BP oil spill. Uh, last year, that hurricane that hit the East Coast was one of the ten hugest natural disasters in the whole history of the U.S. You know, um, war, famine, disease, overpopulation, the whole litany of stuff. This tends to just happen more under a Uranus-Pluto square. Okay? And a technology, again, Uranus ruling technology, Pluto transformation. The 60s was an amazing time for technology. All these things were invented in that decade. We had a moon landing. Uh, space exploration, we had the pill. My God, that revolutionized everything. Now women could be sexually active and not get pregnant, you know? Um, satellites were created for the first time. Uh, the first video games came out, Pong. <laughs> I loved Pong, it was cool, you know? <laughs> the first computers, cassette tape. Whoa, I can take music on the road with me. How cool is that, you know? The first ATMs, the first lasers. You know, we take that stuff for granted, but that was all brand new in the 60s, revolutionary technologies. And now, cloud computing and smartphones and iPads and social networking and electric and hybrid cars, high-tech medicine, I mean, all this stuff is just blossoming out so fast we can hardly keep track of it. So again, I think we'd agree we're in a time of very rapid and stunning revolutionary change faster and faster. I mean, if your iPad's a year old, it's like obsolete, you know? <laughs> So things are changing very fast, and Uranus Pluto is about great speed. You know, Pluto is slow, but Uranus wants it yesterday. Put them together, things get really rapid. And again, Uranus Pluto, remember uh, the last time they squared, it was the Great Depression. Um, economic instability is a factor here too. Um, what do we got? We have the mortgage crisis. Uh, I think something like 25% of all U.S. homes are underwater, wow. at least. It's crazy, you know? We had all that predatory banking and housing practices exposed. Um, you know, we were cruising in, just everyone carrying massive debt, and now people are not willing to do that anymore. So it's all, you know, the economic thing and what's happening in Europe. Oh my God, you know, Greece appears likely to default. Uh, there's no guarantee the euro will survive as a, as a legitimate currency. 
And, and the world is so linked now. This was not true in the last time around. Each country was kind of its own thing. Now the global economy is so completely interrelated. If one major zone falls, they all fall. So if Europe falls, America will fall. If America falls, Europe will fall, et cetera. So we're all in it together now. So the all one thing is a good thing on that score because we all have to take care of each other more to survive ourselves. So that's a plus. <laughs> All right, so we need paradigm shifts, which is another Uranus-Pluto theme. Um, both science and traditional religion under themselves are polarized and incomplete. Science, of course, looks at the material world only and doesn't take a spiritual factor in. Uh, traditional religion you know, is hostile to science a lot and doesn't acknowledge the mystical. So we've got to bring it all together, and, and a lot of that merging is happening all the time. Uh, we at our uh, AWIP meeting here had a, uh, a medical doctor who sat up and say, I don't prescribe pills or, or prescriptions. I use it all with herbs and natural things, which I thought was really cool. So more and more people are integrating the, the more radical stuff with the more mainstream stuff. Uh, in terms of astrology, ruled by Uranus, by the way, it's having another renaissance. All right? Anytime Uranus does a major thing, astrology tends to reemerge more strongly. That's just something I like. <laughs> So one of the big questions is how can we shift from separation to unity consciousness, all right? Because this, as I'll get to in more detail, the only way to, to work with this stuff, here, here's the bottom line the way I see it. You know, no one knows what's really going to happen when December 21st, 2012 hits, but I know how to prepare for it, okay? And it's not about stockpiling guns and ammo and canned food, all right? It's about connecting to your intuitive guidance. You know, um, how many people here have at one point or they had an intuitive flash where information came down from nowhere and they just knew it was true. Anyone had that? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Preaching to the choir. Okay. That part of you can see what's coming and it knows what you should do. So the single best preparation for 2012 is to do whatever gets you connected to your intuitive wisdom. The more you can become a conscious being of light walking around in a physical body, the better prepared you are because spirit will put you in the right place at the right time if you follow your inner instructions. And again, the, the invocation we're going to do at the end is going to help you do that more effectively, perhaps, than you're doing it now. Of course, if you're already super evolved, you won't need it, but many of us, we find it helpful. <laughs> Eckhart Tolle, who's, whose book, A New Earth, I strongly recommend. He does a beautiful job of describing how the ego sabotages our best interests and how the ego is actually the source of all our problems. <laughs> but there's a way to housebreak it. You know, my ego is mostly housebroken now, and it's, it's behaving much better, all right? <laughs> and, and really, I have, I've had more, more and more clients come in, in in extreme crisis. They used to come in and say, what's my chart look like? They come in and say, I'm about to go crazy, what's going on? And we're, many of us now are really in a mode, we either wake up or we go crazy. You know, the things are getting so chaotic out here, the energy is ramping up so fast, that if you don't awaken, the stress of the shifting energies is going to be too much for you and it will sometimes literally drive you crazy. So I'm, I'm a big fan of the awaken option, personally. <laughs> okay, because there's no option. You, you, we have to wake up now because the calls are getting louder and louder and louder and louder. So into the unknown with Uranus and Pluto. So one thing we can expect is surprises, which again, I mentioned Uranus rules. Maybe we'll finally have acknowledgement of all the ETs that have been visiting us for so long, you know? There could be, I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen, there could be global financial collapse or other collapses, a U.S. cultural civil war of some kind. I mean, there's a lot of us versus them rising with the whole 99% and 1% theme and all that. And there could be mass awakening. I'm, I'm all for that. So again, uh, the thing about this, this big a shift is there could be really major, quote, negative effects or there could be really amazingly positive effects. And it all really determines how the, the populace plays it out. And I will mention, each of you influences that. Because each person's consciousness radiates into the collective. And if one person awakens, it radiates this beautiful energy out and it helps all the other people awaken a little bit more easily. So don't think you don't make a difference. Each one of us is totally wired into the entire web of consciousness. And what each of us does, does impact everyone else. You know, the old butterfly flaps its wings and around the world the weather changes kind of thing. So your, your personal awakening to whatever degree actually assists everybody else in moving in that direction. So you do make a difference. All right, so the question becomes, what revolutionary transformation will we planetary citizens visualize into being? So we all make the difference. 
So I mentioned we'd do some invoking. So we've seen how powerful Uranus and Pluto are. What do you say we get on their good side? Yeah. <laughs> so again, this is an optional activity. And if you aren't into this kind of weird stuff, then just sit and you can, uh, and you can say within yourself, leave me out of this, please. And, and you won't be hit with the energy. Otherwise, you will, all right? <laughs> All right, so now again, you talk to a planet just like you would talk to a friend, okay? They're just, they're beings and they have consciousness. And again, the, the physical planet is not going to crush you, don't worry, all right? It's just, <laughs> it's just the consciousness of the planet, okay? So what we're gonna do is, a, now when I do this with clients, we, we get detail, we look into how, in this planet, how is it set up in what sign, what house, what is it connecting to otherwise, what houses does it rule, we get technical with it, and we do a very detailed invocation. But tonight, we're just going to do a real simple one, okay? So um, let's think of the high sides of Uranus, okay? The, and we'll just take a few points and see if we can invoke them. I, for Uranus, what I would want in Uranus in my life would be, I would want to get lots of intuitive flashes and follow them. That's what it experts at. I'd want to really individuate and become the unique being that I signed up to be when I was born. You know, not afraid to become my, my magnificent whatever, you know, because someone might think badly of me. It's like, I gotta just be me, let my freak flag fly a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, um, but Uranus is kind of a two stage. The first stage of Uranus, which is also the Aquarian energy, by the way. Uranus and Aquarius kind of are equivalent energies. One's a planet, one's a sign. First, you got to do your individual thing. You say, I, got to, I have to have the courage to step into my own unique path and do it even if others are telling me I'm crazy. Um, and then, once you develop that skill, then you say, wow, how can I help people with this? Because if you don't have the courage to individuate and do your unique thing, then you never develop your gift so you can share it. Okay, so that I think we're going to invoke too. So any questions on the Uranus before we actually do the energetic invocation? Yes. Um, crystals play any part in, in this for the change of energy surrounding it at all? Or? Use your crystals like you see fit. We're crystal visions, after all. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll see something. All right. Yeah. Another question. Well, it's a square actually, right now. Okay. The conjunction in the '60s was in Virgo. Right now, Uranus is Aries and Pluto is Capricorn. Okay. All right, good question. Any others? All right, so let's shut our eyes. And I'm going to have you repeat after me, and let me tell you why. Because when you say it yourself, you then are speaking directly to the planet. And invocations are much more powerful when you do them yourself as opposed to someone doing them for you. So I'm going to ask you to repeat out loud after me. Okay, here we go. Uranus. Uranus. I call you now. Help me receive my intuitive flashes easily and act on them without hesitation. Help me uniquely embody my special talents and gifts and help me serve the greater good as I attain mastery of them. Uranus, Uranus. Come, to me now come to me now and grant me this energetic shift to the greatest extent that serves the highest good, the highest good. Right, now. right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the invocation is complete. Now your job is to simply be aware of your breathing. Please do not visualize. Do not use any more words mentally. Become aware of your breathing and notice the sensation of the breath coming into your body. What do you feel in your nose, your throat, your chest, your belly? And as the breath goes out, what do you feel in your belly, your chest, your nose, and your throat? If any thoughts arise of any kind, as soon as you're aware of these distractions, Please do not fight the thoughts or try to change them. Turn your back on them and return to your awareness of your breath. You are not controlling your breath. You are simply observing what it's already doing. Mm -hmm. Here it comes. 
Yeah, the Iranian energy is definitely coming into the room, so just relax. Now, even though your breath is your primary focus, you have plenty of peripheral awareness remaining to feel the energy coming in. Uh, you, there are different phenomena happening in different people right now. Some people are feeling tingling, some are feeling heat. There's a unique quality to the energy of Uranus. So just breathe and allow it to come in and do its thing for you. Remember you called it to do this work to the greatest extent that serves the highest good. And everything you invoke is always managed by your own higher self, which is always looking out for your best interests. So only things that are life-affirming and positive will be happening because of this shift. <coughs> Even if it feels kind of intense, just by staying aware of your breath, and letting that be your center, your anchor, your focus, you'll be just fine. <laughs> okay. Can open your eyes now. Well, that changed the energy in the room, didn't it? <laughs> okay, any really quick questions or comments about what we just did before we go on to Pluto? Yes? Well, I've had this big thing happen where I get like a, I get like some kind of like, I might call it an intruder flash, but then I like, I, I, I like, it's like, it doesn't feel like, you know, quite done yet. And then I let it kind of like, play it, I, I kind of like let it go through me for a while. Like, um, like, it's like, 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 a, well, like maybe a project or something mm -hmm. or a direction. Right. And then I get the intruder class, and, I, and then, I, and it, but it seems like way out there, and like maybe it's like not in my best interest. So I, so I let it kind of play, play around, knock around in my head. Right. And then, and then, like a lot of times it doesn't turn out that it really was a good idea to do it. But I didn't. Here's the thing about intuitive flashes: you have to act on them. The opportunity will pass if you don't run with it. Well, but if like if some something. Right. A long time to ask. Okay, I think I better take you want your. To plan it out first. Okay, I think I better take your question later privately okay. because it's sounding a little too complicated to answer <laughs> in a quick time here. But but ask me again later, and I'll okay. be happy to address that. Um, the basic thing I have found, though, to to answer a related question is when I check with my clients when they get an intuitive flash that's an instruction, and I say, okay, you can probably think of times when you've acted on your intuitive flashes, other times you haven't, you've second guessed them and done different things, and I say which of those strategies tends to work out better. Every, I've done this several hundred times, and every single one says it really worked out better when I followed the intuitive flash. I think most of you would probably have the same observation if you think back when you had the flashes and you did or didn't do them. So it's like you're getting text messages from God, you know. <laughs> Good idea to do this one, and I find it is better to, to do those. Okay, let's, let's do Pluto, okay? So um, the high side of Pluto is wealth and power. Okay, the, the operation of Pluto, the first thing it does is it has to take out what no longer serves you. It brings the wrecking ball in, okay, this has to go. Okay, we have to destroy or transform this status quo because it's outlived its usefulness. But then it brings and empowers the growth of the new thing, like the, the caterpillar into the butterfly metaphor. So what we're going to call for Pluto is, Pluto, help me release and comfortably surrender all that no longer serves me. Okay? Because if you just let the stuff go when it comes up to release, it's painless and very smooth. It's only when you try to hang on past this due date that you start the suffering process, right? <laughs> yeah, so as you release the stuff, then the new power comes in to say, please grant me your power and wealth. And, and the glyph for Pluto is kind of interesting. It looks like a person with their arms raised to heaven to me, saying, I surrender, woohoo! <laughs> And what you're surrendering to is the divine power. You know, I think of the, the scene in the first Star Wars movie, you know, episode four, A New Hope. Right? Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader <laughs> on the Death Star, right? And, uh, and Obi-Wan Kenobi suddenly says, if you strike me down now, I will become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> and what, and the empty robe flutters to the floor, right? <laughs> so what did he do? 
he, he gave up a limited version of himself to become omnipresent. All of a sudden, run, Luke, run! <laughs> <laughs> and now Obi-Wan Kenobi can be anywhere, anytime. So that's a metaphor. Now, you don't have to actually give up your body. This is good. <laughs> but the point is, if you surrender the limited version of yourself, the limited consciousness, and you open to say, okay, spirit, I surrender to you, and rather than me micromanaging everything from my ego, from what my personality thinks, I'm going to say, you run the show. Spirit, you, you send the energy and you let me know what to do. What I've observed in my own evolution, especially the last few years, is that the more I give up the desires of Benjamin and just say, spirit, thy will be done. You know, my metaphor now is I want to be a puppet in a pipe. Okay, a puppet, God pull my strings, move me around, you know. Um, and a pipe, just flow through me, whatever will serve, whatever's out there. And just living by that principle has created an amazing shift in me. Um, and that's the key to Pluto, in my opinion. For those who are interested in spiritual evolution, the more you surrender the ego preferences and say, Spirit, whatever you want, I'm happy to do. Um, to what I discover is that for every strong desire and way it has to be that you hold as a human, to that degree are you blocking the divine uh, flow through yourself. Okay. Now, of course, if Spirit says that's what you should do, that's a whole different story. And this may make more sense to some of you than others, but you'll reach a point in your evolution where you say, wow, all I want to do is just what my intuition tells me. I just want to run by divine GPS. You know, and that can happen. So with Pluto, what I want to build into this invocation, if, it, if it's all right with you, is say, Spirit, help me surrender all that doesn't serve me, including my limited human perceptions of the way things ought to be. And help me just surrender to the divine flow of power and wealth. And wealth is, it can be money, obviously, right? But it, wealth is anything of value, and I have found nothing of more value than to have access to this amazing power, because I have literally found the more I surrender and just be the tool for spirit, the more power flows through me, the direct correlation. Does that make any sense? Okay, so I'll phrase that in a way that won't be just too weird, all right? <laughs> all right, so any questions on Pluto before we invoke? Okay, and again, if, you, if you're not ready for this concept, just say, leave me out of this one. <laughs> but if you'd like to do it, we'll speak it now. Okay, so close your eyes. Mm. Please repeat after me. Pluto, Pluto. I, call I call you now. Please help me surrender, help me surrender. And, easily and easily release all that no longer serves me. Please inundate, me Please inundate me with your wealth and power, with your wealth and power. especially the power, especially the power. Of, the of the divine energy. Help me release my preferences, release my preferences. To, do the divine will. to do the divine will and thus increase the power, thus increase the power. that flows through me. Help me receive the wealth, <coughs> and, receive the wealth and unlimited abundance, and unlimited abundance that, comes to me that comes to me when I surrender to the divine. Please make this so now to the greatest extent that serves the highest good, the highest good. Right, now. right now. Thank you. Okay, just like before, the invocation is complete. Now you just be with your breath. Hmm. That didn't take long. Just stay with your breathing. Let the power come in. Those of you who are sensitive are noticing this is a very different flavor of energy. Each of the planets has their own taste, so to speak. Once again, I'll remind you, please don't try to visualize anything. Please don't use any additional words. The more you just notice your breathing and keep your ego out of the way, this will leave the maximum space for the beautiful energy of Pluto to come in and do its beautiful work for you. Mm. Remember also, you will never get more than you can handle when you do an invocation properly phrased.
if you feel things coming up, because Pluto tends to bring things up buried that aren't ready to go, any challenging emotions or thoughts that arise, just stay with your breath. Don't do anything with the thought. Don't do anything with the emotion. Let it come up and be released at its own rate. This is all on autopilot. Everything's happening automatically. Your divine self is so much smarter than your ego, it's not even funny. <laughs> okay, you can open your eyes. That changed the room. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Now the energy is going to keep working you for a while, probably. So if you actually felt some energy, would you just show me with your hand that you felt something? Good. Sweet. Okay. All right. Any burning questions before we move on around that? Okay. If you know the basic ideas about the planetary energies and astrology, what they basically represent, you can invoke them anytime you want. They're eager and waiting. So, yes? <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, in, like Saturn, like the clouds, Saturn brings up this stuff too. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. the yeah, they're both challenging planets. Okay. Saturn, uh, they work in a similar way, actually, in a weird way, because Saturn, when he transits along, he says, I challenge the structures. You know, what he says is, how is your structure? Is it solid and well-grounded? In that case, fine, we'll build a new story on the house. Is your structure teetering and wobbly? Well, we either have to shore it up or we got to tear it down. So they actually do function in a similar way, you know, by transit. You're right. But when they square off in the sky, it's like Saturn tends to try to hold the line the way things are, and Pluto says, no, we got to transform it. So it depends on context. Does that make sense? Okay, good. And we're really not going to talk about Saturn tonight because he's not a major player in 2012. At least we get that break. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you're, you're saying about something, you know, Capricorn, you've been talking about Capricorn. Well, yeah. what, like, what, how long is, is that just for like this month? Well, Pluto and Capricorn? No, oh. They're, they're Capricorn. Oh, yeah, he's there for like, what did I say, another 15 years or so. He's a, he's a long term <laughs> resident. He's going to be there a long time. Okay. All right, let's go on to Neptune. Okay. Another major player. We have another major. Now, the, the, the sign changes I've talked about so far did not actually happen this year. I mean, Uranus came into Aries back in 2008. Pluto hit Capricorn around the same time. Oh, I'm sorry, 2010, Uranus came into Aries, Pluto into Capricorn in 2008. But this is new, Neptune and Pisces. Okay, so the themes we're going to cover on Neptune and Pisces, yes? Um, before you leave the square, you said both moves were so how long is the square Okay, uh, the exact squares are going to be 2012 through 2015, seven times. Energetically, the squares act to 2008 through 2018. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, uh, the themes we're going to cover on Neptune and Pisces after we have our historical overview is awareness of illusion. I'll say that again. Awareness of illusion, dissolutions and endings, imagination and inspiration, experiencing oneness, compassion and forgiveness, escapism, disillusionment, and the victim martyr syndrome. Okay, it's a lot of stuff. All right, <laughs> what happened the last time he was there? 1848 to 1861. It was a while back, and I've given the exact dates there in smaller print if you want to be that particular about it. <laughs> Spirituality, spiritualism, table knocking, you know, mediumship got huge in the U.S. around then. It really was popular. Uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to Bernadette in at Lourdes, France. Okay, that's a, still a famous spot. For, for pilgrims. And Rudolf Steiner was born, the founder of the Anthroposophical Society. <laughs> All right. Uh, economics, we had the California Gold Rush. Okay. I guess this, this time we had the mortgage rush. <laughs> um, and more resonantly, financial and economic crisis throughout Europe caused by speculation in U.S. railroad shares happened the last time Neptune was in Pisces. And we had a whole bunch of speculation in mortgage derivatives, similar. And the first oil well was drilled in Pennsylvania. And it's interesting, now Neptune's coming to Pisces and we're ending the, nearing the end of the oil era. You know, I'm sure we've hit peak oil by now and we're, that's in decline now. So it started big time. Neptune, Pisces actually rules oil. Um, and and the, the weird way is oil, before it was found in the ground, was gotten out of Wales. 
whale oil was the oil that was used in the world more before actual black gold was hit. And because whales are in the ocean and Pisces rules the ocean, you know, Neptune, the god of the ocean, right? So in, a, in astrology, oil has been ruled by Pisces and Neptune. That's the logic behind that. So oil is a strong Piscean theme as well. Uh, what about literature? Talk about a golden age of literature. Dickens wrote David Copperfield, Bleak House, A Tale of Two Cities, Great Expectations, uh, The Scarlet Letter, Moby Dick, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Walden, Lisa Grass, Madame Bovary. I mean, some of the greatest literature classics in U.S. history were all written, or the world literature, were written in this Neptune and Pisces era last time. So we can expect a lot of really cool, you know, creative stuff going because Neptune, Neptune and Pisces are the same letter of the astrology alphabet. Neptune is the modern ruling planet of Pisces. He's at home there. He's strong. And they both rule divinely inspired creativity. So we can expect now that Neptune's about to pop back into Pisces for many years uh, to have a lot of super, there should be a lot of amazing music, and literature, and movies, and all that. Pisces and Neptune also rule cinema and TV, by the way. Yeah. Anything that's acting, imagination, fantasy, that's, that's their territory. What happened in music the last time? Well, that was the era of opera, okay? So we had some of the most classic operas. Wagner finished the text of the Ring Cycle. Uh, Verdi wrote Rigoletto and La Traviata. Gunaud wrote Faust. And Puccini and Mahler were born. So some pretty strong musical events. Uh, and uh, the Communist Manifesto was written, a world-changing book. And that's about we're all one when it's done right. <laughs> it's just, we haven't managed to get communism right yet, have we? All right. The Crystal Palace, this amazing structure, this gorgeous, beautiful structure was erected using plate glass like it had never been used before. And this really caught my attention. It's, it's not so thematic relevant, but it was just the timing blew my mind. The Civil War began on April 12, 1861. Now this is, you know, this is as Neptune was about to go into Aries. Okay, this is many years before we, this is going to be a long time before that happens for us. But it's like, the Civil War began the day before Neptune moved from Pisces to Aries. It was just amazing timing. Because Neptune is my ideals, you know, the, the Civil War was bought, brought about slavery to a large degree. You know, the ideal of humanity being, you know, even a black person had a right to be a citizen and all that. And then Neptune moves into Aries War the day after um, the Civil War begins. That was amazing timing. Okay, so let's get into the themes of Neptune and Pisces. I'm going to pause a second. Are there any questions about this so far? Okay, yes? I should have put that in there, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, what an oversight, wow, okay. Um, let me think about that. Neptune has a... 14 years, 48 to 61. 48 to 61, so that's about... 14 years then. Okay, so about a 14 year. I, I may have it in here somewhere. If we don't get to it, I can actually pull up my astrology program and look. Okay, but it's a roughly a 14 year period. Thank you. All right, awareness of illusion. Okay, unawakened human life is all ego projections. Um, now this is a little challenging for some folks, but from the mystical perspective, and, and I myself have done a lot of mystical work in shamanism and ayahuasca journeys, and I have really been shown in those visions that this whole physical world is just a vast illusion. Okay, it's all game playing and, and fantasy in a way. It seems real while we're here, of course, but dreams seem real when you're dreaming them too. But in reality, there's really no objective reality here at all from a high mystical perspective. Um, I had a really interesting ayahuasca journey a while back where I was taken to, God, seven or eight different realities beyond the physical world. And each one was its own unique fascinating, it, like there was one that was like a lava lamp, everything was just oozing around, you know, it's like, it's like you're getting some weird stuff when you drink ayahuasca, let me tell you. But, but the, I, I, what I got was, I was shown with enough examples and got the vision that, okay, there's an infinite number of these universes. Each one was its own full universe, you know, not even relating to the physical world. It was a totally different realm, all right? There's an infinite number of more being created all the time, and I really got that God really loves making stuff. You know, <laughs> what weird stuff can I put out there next? You know, <laughs> it's like there's just a great joy in creation, just ongoing. And what I got was none of them are real because they all arise and they all fall away, even if it takes billions of years. And the only true reality is that undifferentiated light at the source that manifests everything out into the 
the manifest world. So it, it's a, from that perspective, everything that happens in the physical world is all just illusion. You know? And yet, while you're here, it seems very real. So you know, that's part of a Neptune Pisces thing. All right? um, so when you awaken, if anyone here has an interest in, in getting that perspective of, wow, I, I see the illusion for what it is, and I'm coming from this more divine consciousness, then you awaken to the illusory nature of what's going on down here. I didn't say it wasn't important, by the way. <laughs> it's an important illusion. <laughs> but the inability to awaken results in drowning, and the, the, the answer is to live as conscious divine beings, otherwise we remain ensnared in suffering. Because as long as we think we're this ego, we think we're this body, we're going to suffer. That's, all, that's the game. All right? The Buddha kind of got that idea out there. You know, but uh, my own, you know, I'm not an enlightened being at this point. I hope to get there. But um, what I've discovered, the more I've moved toward that, though, and more that I can hold that perspective, like as I stand here right now, what I perceive myself to be is a being of light, and this Benjamin thing is the car I'm driving around. You know? <laughs> this is not me, not even close, all right? And, and I know many people who have had that same perspective on things. And, and what we're going to do, you know, in about half an hour is going to give you that experience yourself if you're willing to have it, okay? I know many of you have already had that experience here. You're, we got a pretty high vibration crowd here. But um, it is, is important, I think, with all the, the crazy that the whole 2012 thing is bringing and the Uranus Pluto Square is bringing, here, here's, the, here's the benefit. All right? I have a lot of Capricorn, and I like things to be practical here in the physical world, too. If you can establish your consciousness as a divine being, and you really have the, not just the belief, but the experience that you are that being of light, uh, let me tell you one other ayahuasca experience that really brought this home the first time. Um, uh, I, had a, I had what I called my breakthrough Sunday, where I had about an eight-hour bliss journey. It was just it was like an orgasm that never ended. It was so amazing, right? I was out of my body, traveling around. First time ever I'd broken out. I'd tried for years to get there. And, oh, it's happening! Woo! All right? And, <laughs> and at one point in the vision, I saw my physical body destroyed. The snake came up and bit it with venomous fangs. The body died. It burned to ashes, and then a vacuum hose came and sucked the ashes away, right? This is vision, sorry. <laughs> and from my perspective as a being of consciousness, I said, you know, I honestly don't know if that really just happened or not. <laughs> and I don't care. <laughs> I was so delighted to be an ecstatic being of light. I said, if, if, I, if I'm done with that physical thing, woohoo! Let's see what's next, you know? <laughs> and she's killed me twice more since then, and it was the same thing every time. And whenever I have the death vision, it's like, oh, good. Maybe I'm free now. And, and what it's done for me is, is shaken the fear of death off. And now I don't care. You know, as long as I am here, I, I know I can't die till it's my time. You know, none of us can. And as long as I can be here and being of service, cool, I love this gig. It's a great gig being a human. And when the body drops, cool, I get to be a divine being without the, the constriction of the physical world again. It's like, you can't lose. <laughs> and, and it is possible to get to that state where you're delighted to be here while you're here and delighted to leave when it's time to leave. And it's just like, cool, either way, it's fine. Anyhow, um, and that's not an invitation to suicide, by the way. <laughs> that's not what I was saying. <laughs> What I'm saying is you're no longer a fear of the, the transition because what you are, that consciousness, is totally immortal and cannot be destroyed. There's the part of you that matters can never die. And once you actually experience that, whether it's through ayahuasca or any kind of other mystical experience, then you know that. Okay. And I know there's many of you here who've already had that experience. Cool. I won't embarrass you by asking you to raise your hand, so. All right. <laughs> I'm not ready to come out of the closet on that one. All right. <laughs> Okay, let's get back to Neptune and Pisces. Dissolution and endings. Um, just like Pluto, Neptune is also about old structures falling, but Neptune just kind of dissolves them away, all right? So we have new paradigms emerging. There is a sense of loss when things go away. Some of us have attachments, right? But you honor and have gratitude for what's phasing out. But again, if you cling to structures whose time has passed, you suffer, guaranteed, all right? The caterpillar has to become the butterfly. Okay, similar theme to Pluto, actually. All the outer planets have some things in common, actually. What about imagination and inspiration? Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge, and he stuck his tongue out to prove the point. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I pointed out with all those examples of all the cool stuff that happened the last time Neptune was in Pisces, all the books and music and all, 
fertile ground for anything contemplative, access to higher levels of consciousness, a vision of how to reshape culture and society. The answers are all out there, and you don't have to watch the X-Files to learn that. What you do is you just say, hey, give me the answer. Um, I try to use my intellect as little as possible. <laughs> I mean, really, it's, so, it's such a pathetic, um, you know, limited thing compared to intuition. Um, and I will promise you, once you can get into that light body, and when you're in the light body, you are intuition. That's how that thing runs. Intuition is how the divine thinks. And once you're there, you just know stuff. And you don't have to logic it. It's just the information literally just pops in when it needs to be there, and you know it. It's like on-demand everything. You know, it's cool. So the, if you really get into the Neptune Pisces flow, then you have access to all this amazing stuff that you don't have to research or go to the internet to find out. You just know, and it's just on time delivery. Pretty cool. All right, so experiencing oneness, a big Neptune Piscean theme. Neptune and Pisces rule mystical union and one with God and all that stuff. So with Neptune in Pisces, it's a wonderful time to expand beyond separateness and experience greater oneness. Uh, now, last time this happened, we had the whole spiritualist thing where it was kind of a big deal to communicate with the departed. And there was a lot of mediumship going on. At that point in culture, that was as far as they could get with Neptune and Pisces. They weren't ready for the kind of mystical breakthroughs that were happening now because humanity has evolved a long way since that time. So now we get a much more you know, deep embrace of that. Um, now, my own belief is that we've already begun the golden age. Okay, I've been shown this in my ayahuasca visions. I, I'm involved with Diksha Oneness Blessing stuff, which actually meets here once a week, I think, and every other places. And the avatars from India who run that, and this is not avatars like in the movie. This is like, you know. <laughs> That'd be cool, but um, no, beings who, who, divine beings who came into physical form to help, you know, everyone wake up on the planet. You know, they say it happened in February. And, and in Vedic thinking, we went from the Kali Yuga, the Dark Age, to the Satya Yuga, which is the Golden Age. Now, if you go research that, there's many different people saying it's many different time frames. But as I observe what's actually happening and know that I'm living my own Golden Age right now, I didn't wait. I'm, let, me, let me be on the cutting edge on this, not just wait for everyone else. So any one of us can live the Golden Age at this moment, and as I mentioned earlier, the more of us do, the easier it is for everyone else. Okay? Um, as you'll experience with these invocations, you can have conscious breakthroughs, the likes of which before the Golden Age shifted would have taken years of really devoted spiritual practice, daily sitting and stuff. Now you can have it in a minute or two because you asked for it. It's really amazing. I hope you stick around for this. It's really good. <laughs> so whatever gets you there, you know, these invocations work because they've worked for just about every single person I've ever given them to for the last year. Uh, by the way, ayahuasca gave them to me. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yeah, I, I was given the invocation system in an ayahuasca ceremony. Um, ayahuasca is an intelligent being and she talks to you when you're in, in ceremony with her. Okay. Yeah. yeah, she's a plant spirit teacher. And I'd have to go into a little more explanation that is appropriate here, but if you want to ask me afterwards, I'll be happy to. Or you can Google ayahuasca and you'll see. Okay. Anyhow, but whatever gets you there to the oneness, the beautiful thing is every legitimate spiritual path on the planet is juicing up now. Okay, every one of them. Okay, because it's time to wake up. And, and there will be eventually in 20, 30 years, enlightened consciousness is going to be just as common as mud. Okay, just about everyone's going to understand that they're a being of light walking around in a physical body. It's going to be a total paradigm shift from what we have now. And it, there's no stopping it. Okay, yes? Yeah, right. In other words, those who will fight a tooth and nail to the end will fight a tooth and nail. But the, the outcome is, uh, in my opinion, inevitable. There's no stopping the awakening of the race of all humanity. Yeah, I don't think so anyway, based on what I've seen. Again, I can't speak definitively for anyone but myself, but my visions have shown me that. And that seems to be the trend. Okay. okay Asheville's not the only place this is happening. <laughs> okay. Anyhow. And society will naturally evolve to reflect this growing unity and interdependence. But it starts with the individual. Think about it. You can try to impose a change from the outside, but if the consciousness of the person hasn't changed, good luck. All right? The big shifts happen from the inside out. Once a person wakes up and realizes I'm really one with everything and all these faces I'm looking at are just manifestations of me, okay, Michael Jackson had a song about that, you know? It's amazing. <laughs> I got, what? If I hurt you, I'm hurting myself. 
And when you awaken that, if you cause pain outside yourself, you feel the pain in you. So you don't, you know? You, yeah, so that, that becomes a more real thing. And compassion and forgiveness are a natural corollary of that. As we emerge from unconsciousness, we can easily have compassion and forgiveness for those who haven't awakened yet. And we radiate unconditional love to everything, which helps everyone else heal and wake up. So, um, and we'll, when we do our, our experiential piece, I'll try to make time so we can do a, a sending light and love to other people, where you get exactly what you send out instantly. It's like total, as you give, so you receive on the spot. Very cool. And the cool thing is, once you realize how that works, if you start getting angry at people, you say, oh my God, I'm angry. I'm feeling like crap myself. Maybe I should stop this. It doesn't feel good, you know? You begin to realize, wow, everything I send out to another person totally is in me, too. So you begin to, just for your own self-interest, you stop doing the negative stuff and start focusing on more positive emotional states. It's really interesting. Of course, one challenge of Neptune Pisces is escapism. You can get lost in imagination and fantasy. I live for second life, you know? <laughs> uh, war, World of Warcraft, that's what I do, right? So you can get addicted to the realms of fantasy and lose potency in this world. Um, but ideally, you want to uh, take a message from, remember I mentioned Pisces to Aries with the Civil War? In a more positive way, Pisces is dreaming, imagining, fantasizing. And when you roll over to Aries, the first sign, it's like, okay, now let's physicalize it. Let's make it real. Let's be the beginning in the physical world of what I've been holding in my mind. Okay. Um, to put it in summary, the dark side of Neptune Pisces is escape in a negative, life-destroying way. That's excessive alcohol, excessive drugs, um, excessive just losing yourself in TV, sex, food, games, internet, whatever your escape is. Now, a little bit's all right, but if you're escaping so much that you're not taking care of business in your life, then that's too much. The upside of Pisces Neptune is oneness with the divine, feeling the beautiful flow in you or traveling out to other dimensions. It's about the creative person getting all this beautiful inspiration, Mozart hearing the symphony in his head, you know, the artist seeing the canvas in their mind and then painting it, just receiving inspiration that way. And of course, radiating unconditional love and compassion and light to others. Those are the high side of Pisces. And the way astrology always works, everything in astrology, sign, uh, planet, whatever, has a dark and light spectrum. And the more you focus your attention into the light side possibility, the less energy is left over to do the dark side. It's just that simple. So, so that's kind of the philosophy on the whole Neptune Pisces thing. You know, do more of the things that are feeling good and the positive life affirming, and there's just not a whole lot of impulse left over to do the negative things. Make sense? Okay. All right, and again, the disillusionment victim martyr syndrome. You can become disillusioned with life, lose your vitality, go into a victim martyr thing, another dark side Pisces thing. But again, if you surrender to your inner wisdom, be the puppet and pipe like I talked about, then you can really flow into this beautiful thing and not have to sacrifice yourself. You don't really help the other person by sacrificing yourself in a way that hurts you. It just doesn't give the positive outcome. Okay? So, any questions on Neptune Pisces before we invoke it? Okay? So who wants to do an invocation so we can all become addicted to drugs and alcohol and become victims and martyrs? And... All right, let's not. <laughs> let's focus on make me one with the divine, help me receive my intuitive flow of wisdom and divine energy, help me be creatively inspired, help me be a, a radiant son of unconditional love and compassion for everyone and everything. Does that sound okay? Okay. And again, if you want to, don't want to do that, then, then go have a drink. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, so as always, you can say, please exclude me if you don't want to be part of the process. But those who want to do it, let's go. Okay, so please close your eyes, take a breath. And we're going to invoke Neptune. So if you wish, please repeat after me. Neptune, Neptune. I call you now. Please saturate me, Please saturate me. With, the the with the energy of the divine. Help me to consciously experience, me to consciously experience the, divine being the divine being that I am. Please fill me with inspiration and creativity in all areas of my life. 
Help me run by divine GPS. In your beautiful, easy flow. Help me be a conduit of unconditional love and light to all whom I encounter. Neptune, let this be so. To the greatest extent that serves the highest good. Starting right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, same drill as before. Your invocation's done. Just feel your breath. Notice with the breath. Oh, here. Oh, that's a nice energy. Okay. Just be with your breath. The breath is the engine that drives the process. Stay aware of your breathing and let the energy do its thing on its own. Mmm, lovely. Y'all are getting the hang of this just nice. Hmm. Stay with your breathing. Your peripheral awareness will be enough to feel what's going on. You may be noting that you're becoming more aware of yourself as a light being and not quite so much as a physical body. So just allow that to happen. It'll only happen to the extent that you can handle it. Spirit will not overwhelm you, I promise. Each of your experiences is being completely controlled by your own higher self. You are totally protected here. You may notice an intensified somatic awareness. You're just more sensitive in your skin. You're feeling things a little more intensely. That's pretty common. So stay with your breath. And some of you may be noting there's a bliss and ecstasy that comes in. A very common side effect of invocation. The more you become a being of light, the more you exist in a state of bliss and ecstasy. It just comes with the territory. Mm-hmm. Nice. Okay, you can open your eyes. Mm. I like Neptune. <laughs> Any questions or comments before we go forward? Yes. Awakening. <laughs> uh, those who use it less consciously are going to get caught on the dark side, like drugs, alcohol, escapism. Those who use it more consciously have a tremendous opportunity for awakening and enhanced creativity, enhanced ability to flow love and light to others. Those of you who are energetically sensitive, by the way, um, the best defense. now. Does anyone here have the experience, I'm so sensitive, I find it difficult to go out into certain environments or interact with certain people because I get overwhelmed with all the negative shit and it's really hard? Yeah, I work with a lot of clients like that. The best defense is not shielding or armoring. The best defense is to be so friggin' bright and so saturated with light that anything dark that comes at you just gets burned up in the photosphere, it never hits you. Yes? Um, is there any significance to my rising sign actually being Pisces? Uh-huh. Yes, that means Neptune will be crossing your ascendant at some point in the next few years. And you have high, uh, the ascendant is like the mask or persona you present to the world. Therefore, you would be unusually sensitive to everything around you compared to most people. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so again, if you just keep invoke, and I'll show you again after the break how to invoke this so you just stay super bright and it takes almost no effort. You just ask and it literally happens right away. So if you just stay bright and stay full of light, then you got no worries. Yes, go ahead. Um, Pisces and Aries are right next to each other on the chart. Yes. They're two outer planets that are going to be next to each other for a while. Well, not exactly next to. I mean, Neptune's coming into Pisces, Uranus is in Aries. So they're actually about a sign apart. And Uranus is definitely moving ahead by number. So they're not interacting directly much right now. Oh, okay. 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 Good question, though. Okay, any questions at this juncture? And we might, uh, Nicole, start the basket around. Okay. What she's going to do now is pass a basket around for two reasons. One is so you can put your slip in there. Again, 
the, uh, to put your name and email, and if you don't have an email, just your phone number will do. Um, this is gonna put you in the drawing for the free consultation and get you on my newsletter. And also, if you have not already given a love offering, if you wish, then you can put some money in there if you feel like tonight's event is worth anything to you and you wish to give, and again, you can take it for free, that's perfectly fine. If you feel like it's appropriate to put something in there, then you're welcome to do that too. So that's what the basket's going around. Be sure to put your slip in there, and if you want to put some you know, love offering, that's fine too. But again, totally optional, you know. Okay, so some other things I want to cover briefly before we get to our break is I've covered the two biggies, the Uranus-Pluto square and Neptune coming into Pisces. There's a few other events that are specific to 2012 that are worth talking about astrologically, and I'm, I am going to talk about the Mayan calendar a little bit too, okay? Saturn hits Scorpio in October of this year. It's there through 2014, the end of the year. This is the same deal as Pluto and Capricorn, okay? Because in, a, in the astrology alphabet concept, there's always a planet and a sign that mean the same thing. So I have Pluto and Capricorn, and then I have Saturn and Scorpio. Pluto is the ruler of Scorpio, Saturn's the ruler of Capricorn. It's like these two planets are in each other's signs. You got chocolate on my peanut butter. You peanut butter on my chocolate, right? <laughs> so Pluto in, in Capricorn and Saturn in Scorpio can be the same archetypal message, the destruction of old structures that no longer serve, the creation of new structures that do. Okay? And you're going to see a, an aspect pattern shortly that makes use of this. Okay? So basically destruction of outmoded structures, challenges in new structures and shared resources, um, sexual restructuring or repression. Scorpio is a very sexual energy. One of the effects of the 60s was the sexual revolution. Remember the pill, right? Uranus liberation of Pluto sexuality, okay? And again, um, it could go either way. It could be a restructuring of the sex. Uranus and Aries is certainly a liberating factor there. Aries is, is sexual energy and Uranus is radical freedom. But again, there could be a repression factor too with Saturn's energy of I repress and control and put a boundary around things in Scorpio sexuality. So we're probably going to see both extremes out there. There will be certain segments that it's all about controlling that energy. Others, let's just let it go wild. <laughs> so, yeah. Is that something to do with the whole gay marriage movement and other things like that? Well, that's really not so much about sex as it is about human rights. Um, but in a sense that there's a sexual component, I mean, the whole reason people were, you know, upset about homosexuality because a man was having sex with a man. But that's becoming less in the spotlight and more about these are two human beings who love each other. But I think that is a factor of what you're talking about. So I hope that was a clear answer to your question. Okay. Okay. Um, but again, Saturn and Scorpio can be restriction or restructuring of wealth, restriction or restructuring of power. And we are, I mean, what's the whole Occupy movement about? You know, let's redistribute the wealth a little more fairly. You know, the one thing that may take down the global economic system is it is so wired to funnel money up to the rich and away from the poor and the middle class. It's just not fair. Okay? So it has to be reformed so it is a more equitable system or it has to go down and be replaced by something better. And one of those two things is going to happen in the next few years. Okay. Now here's a cool aspect pattern. Let's, let's get into 2012. The, the 2012, 2012, right? <laughs> there is an aspect pattern, for those of you who don't know, who have been living under a rock, on December 21st, 2012. <laughs> We have the winter solstice, and this is the end of the Mayan long count calendar. Okay? The Mayan long count calendar runs for over 5,000 years. These were really long time keepers. And there was a movie about it that showed horrific destruction of the whole planet pretty much at that point. But the whole idea is there's a lot of fear, confusion, and uncertainty on what does this mean. Okay? So here is an aspect pattern that I think gives us a hint. Okay? An aspect pattern in astrology is three or more planets to make some kind of geometric figure. All right? So on the back end, I have Pluto in Scorpio, I'm sorry, Pluto in Capricorn and Saturn in Scorpio. Again, that's called a mutual reception. This means these guys are in each other's signs, chocolate on my peanut butter, etc. So both these guys can be taken to mean, as I said a moment ago, the destruction of old structures that don't serve us and the empowerment of new ones that do. That's an incredibly strong statement on the back end of the yacht. By the way, the nickname for this thing is the finger of God. <laughs> I kid you not. Right. And my astrology teacher, Kelly Phipps, said that means do this or else. <laughs> and what the yacht points to, the narrow tip, 
is the indicator of what you're moving towards. So what happens is we take out these old structures and build new ones to replace them. We go to Jupiter. In old astrology, Jupiter was considered the great benefic, the planet of hope, optimism, joy, upliftment. It was the best planet you could have, you know? Doesn't get any better than that. And so all this old restructuring of stuff points to new hope and new expansion, and new possibilities, new joy. And it's in Gemini, which says, let's have a variety of things, not just one. Let's, let's dabble, let's have a smorgasbord of wonderful possibilities. So to me, that's a tremendously, and, th and that is the only aspect pattern happening at the winter solstice. And it's exact the day after the winter solstice, okay? It's exact on uh, t December 22nd, one day later. And if that isn't a message in the sky, I don't know what is, all right? So to me, I'm, I'm extremely hopeful about all this, you know? How many of you think the way the world has gone, if it would be better just to keep that going? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you take my point. Okay, the only hope for a wonderful life and even survival is a radical paradigm shift away from what we've done. We can't keep it going or we're going to wipe out ourselves and everything else. Can't do it. Not a possibility. The only way out is a radical restructuring of the old, take out the old stuff that doesn't work anymore and bring in something new. And that is exactly what this describes. And it describes the hopeful outcome that's going to come from it. I totally believe that it's going to be a beautiful time we're moving into in the next several decades. Yeah, go ahead. Do you know when the Venus transit is? The Venus transit, what are you talking about? Well, the aspect of us moving Venus the Earth I have heard of it, but I, I do not know the exact moment. I've heard a lecture on it, though, and I do know what you're talking about. But I'm not expert enough to be able to discuss it here. Right, it is in 2012, isn't it? Before and after that. Right. That is correct, that is correct. Um, but again, um, thank you for bringing that up, but I can't really incorporate it here because I'm not expert enough to bring it in right now. But, but if any of you want to know, that's an extremely rare idea that Venus crosses exactly over the face, it occults the sun is the actual term. And it's a, it's a part of what's going on here too. But again, I can only put so much in 90 minutes, so I couldn't bring in everything. But thank you for bringing that up, yes. A lot of you? Okay, I'm gonna ask you to hold that question and ask me later, okay? Because again, we're, we're nearing our, our mark when I wanna take a short break and then do the experiential stuff, and, and I don't wanna shortchange that part. But feel free to ask me afterwards, okay? Okay, and finally, let's look at how this affects the US chart. This is where we live, after all, right? Okay, now I'm using what's called the Sibley United States chart. There are many competing versions of what is the natal chart of the United States of America. This is the most popular and the one that seems to work for me. So, so July 4, 1776, 5, 10 p.m., Philadelphia. Okay, what are the transits? Okay, major, major, major stuff. Okay, transiting Pluto here around, you know, or, you know, in the single digits of Capricorn has already been opposing Venus. Venus is money. <laughs> Venus is the midheaven ruler of the United States, which means she rules our image and our work in the world. Okay, so Pluto saying, okay, my job is to destroy what doesn't serve you. And, and it was about the time Pluto opposed Venus that we had the near financial meltdown, actually. Interesting timing. Okay, Pluto has now been opposing Jupiter, which is the chart ruler of the United States. We have Sagittarius rising, which means Jupiter is called the ruling planet of the chart. It has special power and significance. So Pluto says the whole persona or mask we show to the world is changing. And people are looking at us different with what's going on in our country lately, you know? Oh, you've got a mortgage meltdown. Oh, you have all these Tea Party people. Not the U.S. we used to know, you know? <laughs> okay, so big changes there. And you're occupying Wall Street. And now they're occupying us. What is <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, so major news there. Okay, so since we know Pluto and Uranus are squaring each other, right? Anything Pluto opposes for the next three years, Uranus is going to square. So that means Uranus is squaring all these guys. All right? So to put it in just plain English as I can, we have the most powerful square, the, the most significant astrological event absolutely of the decade and of the last several decades, all lining up on the most sensitive planets of the U.S. chart. The planets that represent our finances, our, our work in the world, 
the image we show to the world, our politics, which is also Jupiter, and in a couple of years, they're going to line up on the sun, the core of who we are, the core of our identity, and that's going to transform. So the, the transits to the United States natal chart are huge, and they also show massive shift in this country. Does that make sense? And the other thing is, Neptune has just finished conjunction to the U.S. moon. Okay, the moon represents the public in a country's chart. And Neptune is just finishing three years on the U.S. moon, which on a, on a challenge side says, oh, Neptune, one of its dark side meanings, obfuscation. I'm going to bamboozle you. I'm going to fool you, right? And there's been a huge amount of misinformation put out. Obama wasn't born in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and if you look at political advertising, it's all basically misstatements, but legal, because you know, they know they can get your votes more by spreading misinformation than by painting something positive, right? But also, Neptune, the awakener of the public, there's been a mass spiritual awakening happening in the country. You know, it's not in the news very much, because it's not, it doesn't bleed or whatever, but, you know, they make a news. But those of you who are here know that you're seeing people around you awakening all the time. I know two people who are full-blown enlightened. That didn't used to happen, you know? That happened over in India someplace. But <laughs> many of us know someone who's actually awake now. So this stuff is starting to happen, all right? So anyhow, that's, that's kind of some, And the other big news is Uranus on the fourth house cusp of the US. That's the foundation of anyone. The fourth house is the, like the home, your physical location. And Uranus has been dancing the United States fourth house cusp for the last couple of years. So we've seen foundational shift, haven't we? I mean, we, we almost lost our whole financial foundation, right? And now we're seeing the whole Occupy thing saying it's, we don't have a good, fair foundation at all. So there's a lot of revolutionary shakeup happening as a result of this. Does that make sense? So that's, I'm trying to put into as plain in English as I can some of these huge transits that are really affecting us. And just to cover a couple more, um, let me see which of these I want to talk about. These are actually more minor, so I'm going to skip these. But I've, I've told you the big story um, in terms of the really big things happening. All right, so I'm going to skip that. I've talked about that some. I will share these thoughts from Daniel Quinn. I read all of his Ishmael books years ago. Um, and he wrote a, he summed it up in his book, Beyond Civilization. Realize the story you're living in is not the only possible story. After you wake up from the story, help in the ways you're called from within. Don't wait for a leader because we're moving beyond hierarchy. Your intuition is your guide. Your actions, if you follow your intuition, will be synchronistically and automatically woven into the great web of the new story. That's what he was trying to say in all his Ishmael books, if you read them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and I mentioned the whole Mayan calendar shift. You know, everyone's saying there's shift coming. Egyptian astrology is saying it, the Hopi prophecies. The Vedic shift that I talked about, Kali Yuga to Satya Yuga, the Karo, this amazing tribe in Peru is talking about the shift coming. Uh, psychic seers, sensitive, and shamans everywhere are talking about it now. It's, it's becoming widespread. And again, um, to, to, to wrap the whole 2012 thing um, in terms of the whole Mayan calendar part, no one knows for sure, I think, what's actually going to happen. Um, some people say time itself will, will cease to exist and we'll live in this wonderful, timeless, divine state. That'd be nice, all right? Maybe it'll be more like this, but more and more people awaken into the divine consciousness. The avatars who run the oneness blessing or started the oneness blessing thing, they say, it's not going to be an immediate shift, but in 20, 30 years, most humans will be uh, pretty much awake. It's going to be a gradual roll in, yeah. So, uh, just a second. So my, again, I've already given you my advice. Tend to your own spiritual awakening in the most effective way you can. Use a system that works, not that you just believe that is actually giving you quantifiable results. I can feel the shift in me. Things are actually happening when I do this. You know, make sure whatever path you're following is actually giving you results that you can feel and are shifting you. Okay? You know, when I do my ayahuasca work or my oneness blessing stuff or whatever I do, you know, I have people who watch me. I say, look, I'm doing this weird stuff. Keep an eye on me and let me know if you see a danger sign, you know? And all they're saying is you're getting more you know, I see only positive things happening for you. So, you know, have someone you trust watching out for you too, okay? But, but do the shifts. Um, then whatever comes, however dramatic or, or anticlimactic it turns out to be when 2012 hits, 
you can't lose by waking up to your divine self because the bliss, the joy, the lack of suffering, the intuitive guidance, um, the ability to radiate and serve others is just off the scale of wonderful. Yeah, since I really, you know, worked through all of my personal desires and just stepped into a service path, I am happier than I have ever been. And every year is now the best year of my life because the light just grows stronger, my consciousness broadens all the time. And I can't imagine anything I'd rather be doing. And I want that for everybody who wants it. Cool. <laughs> all right, so um, any questions uh, about anything we've covered before we almost take a break? Okay, so uh, just as some reminders, um, I know some people may have to leave before we do the other thing, so I'll just say I am available privately for astrology consultation, shamanic astrology, and shamanic healing. I can mix and match it all in the same session. My website, itsallgoodastrology.com, is on the card, and there's a ton of information there. And all the invocation stuff we're doing is there in writing on the articles page, by the way. Uh, I talked about the podcast. And if you want to get more into astrology, there is a local group that meets every month called the Asheville Friends of Astrology. We meet third Fridays at Earth Fair Westgate, always free. We do these wonderful lectures by Love Offering. So you can check out AshevilleFriendsOfAstrology.org if you'd like to plug into the astrology community here. All right, so close with a little joke. What did the Buddhists say to the hot dog vendor? <laughs> Make me one with everything. Make me one with everything, yeah. <laughs> 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 there's, <a part> th <laughs> there's a part two to the joke. Okay, the Buddhist gives the guy a 20, and the guy gives him back only a hot dog. And the Buddha says, hey, where's my change? And the hot dog says, you should know. Change can only come from within. <laughs> so we will experience how to create change within ourselves simply, simply powerfully, and rapidly as we do these invocations. It does, let me, let me just say, we can take a bathroom break right now. If you need a break, raise your hand. Okay, enough, okay, let's take just as quick as you can. There's two bathrooms just around the corner to the left. Just be as quick as you can and we'll, we'll run back and, and do the other stuff. And in the meantime, those of you who remain, I'm not taking a break, so I, I'm welcome, to, I'm happy to entertain questions as we take the little break so we can just keep it rolling for those who are staying. Yes, Chef. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You'll have to speak louder. I can't hear you. He was starting to consider the versions of the Mayan calendar, and he talked to elders in various traditions of the right. Mayan that are still around. Uh-huh. And our hype basically has it wrong. It's not the end of the calendar. Right. It's, it's a transformation point, like the Vedic shift right. into a new age. Right, the age of flowers. Okay. Yeah. I need to bring that out. Thank you. That's an important point I neglected to mention. Thank you. The yacht is here, here, and here. Nice. Eight degrees, exactly. Cool, so it's on your Neptune. All my kids with Neptune in there. Great. Sweet. That'll be fun. <laughs> No, but, but Capricorn is my strongest energy. I'm actually an Aquarius sun. But uh, when you actually weight up the various signs in my chart, Capricorn outweighs them all. Just because there's some... Oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Right. And I personally preface this by saying that I, I, I've just turned 17. Good. And um, I, I saw a psychic in, in Nashville. Right. And uh, it really sort of opened me. But for a while, I've been experiencing sort of visions of other worlds. Right. You know, this, this sort of psychic intuitions. And I, I did some drawings of them. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just sorry. I always felt this sort of longing to go there, but I never really. Uh, well, you can't go there yourself, but you can be taken. So all you have to do is ask spirit to allow you to visit those worlds to the greatest extent that serves the highest good and just relax and breathe and you'll be taken if you're ready. 
Yeah, Spirit's happy to help you out. <laughs> Nicole, did the basket go all the way around? Okay, good. All right. Okay, sweet. Oh, excuse me. Thank you for coming. Okay, I'm going to scope to see if we still have bathroom people or if we're all here who's going to be here. Just one or two. One or two? All right, cool. Two bathroom people left. Sweet. Thank you for coming. Good night. Okay, we're almost ready. We just have two bathroom people. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> that one bowled me over. <laughs> yeah, we had a glitch on that one, but hopefully it'll be back next month. Okay, let's see what happens if we turn some of these lights off. <laughs> That's nice. Just the light from the mystical umbrella. Okay, let's begin settling our energies, please. Those who weren't quite ready have left. <laughs> or those who had a deadline, you never know. Oh, sure. Okay, sure. Okay, yeah, you do whatever you need for the video, but let's keep it minimal. Yeah. Do you have enough light to do, to see me okay? All right. Thank you. Let's all take a breath or two. And I'm gonna sit for this. Ooh, I should enter. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so will it bother anyone if we go about seven or eight minutes past nine o'clock? Does anyone? All right, okay. So we've already learned how to do this with the planetary invocations. We call the invocation, we relax, we watch our breath. Um, I now surrender myself to spirit guidance to do those invocations which will serve the highest need of all here. Okay, I'll preview each invocation before we do it. The first one will be, Spirit, please grant me the maximum awareness of my light body that serves the highest good right now. Thank you. Before we do it, though, just feel in yourself and just ask yourself, what percentage do I feel like a light body and what percentage like a physical body? Just note within 10% what, what's the rough mix of light to physical, and we're going to compare later. So note that for yourself, and now we'll do the invocation. Please repeat after me if you wish. Spirit, Spirit. Please, grant me please grant me the maximum awareness, the maximum awareness of, my of my light body that serves the highest good, the highest good. Right, now. right now. Thank you. Okay, you know the drill. Just become aware of your breathing. Do not control the breath, but place your full attention 
on the actual sensation of the breath entering and leaving your body. As Now you will become distracted, you can count on it. But each time you notice that you've become distracted, do not try to fight the thought, do not try to change it, turn your back on it and return your attention to your breath. As long as you continue returning to breath awareness, you are doing this perfectly. I will be speaking a lot during this process. My voice is carrying the vibration of the process. Paying attention to my voice will take you deeper into the process. Focus on your breath. Mm -hmm. Make no effort from the ego to help. Any effort at all from the ego will only slow down or stop the process. This is all being orchestrated perfectly by your divine self. There is literally nothing your ego can do to help. The only thing your ego can do to help this process is to stay attentive to the breathing and leave maximum space for spirit to do it for you. It is all divine grace. This work is beyond your ego's pay grade. <laughs> That's it. Now check in again. What's your light body percentage now? Just note if it's changed. You may also be noting that your light body is now feeling like it's expanding beyond your physical body, which leads us to the next invocation. Here is the preview. Spirit, please expand my light body to the hugest size that serves the highest good right now. Thank you. So if you would like to say that one, repeat it after me now. Spirit, Spirit. please expand my light body, expand my body. To, the to the hugest size that serves the highest, that serves the highest good right now. Right now. Thank, you. Thank you. Once again, the ego's job is done. All it has to do now is just relax and be aware of its breathing. Please do not visualize the light body getting bigger on your own. Don't use any extra words. Just be aware of your breathing. The expansion will be handled automatically. time you notice you've become distracted by a thought or anything else, simply return your attention to your breath awareness. Mm, nice. Now maintaining breath focus, feel into this light body and see if you can find an end to it. Can you feel a boundary or does it go on forever? Just note what you're actually experiencing. If you're now having the experience of being a boundless being of light with no boundary, just rest in that awareness and be consciously aware of it. Just sit there and breathe and note what it feels like to be an infinitely large being of light. The fact is, what you really are is the entire universe 
and all the dimensions of consciousness. There is no limit to you. So there is no limit to how large this light body can get. If at any point you are not experiencing what I'm describing, you are still receiving exactly what you need at this point. I would just be in the experience you're having even if it does not match what I'm saying. Again, just to clarify, I am not causing this phenomenon to happen for you. You invoked it yourself from your own higher self. It is managing the process for you. I'm just going along for the ride with you. <laughs> Check in again, what's your light body percentage now? Just note the number and come back to your breath. If the energy is shifting now, those of you who are sensitive are feeling a vibrational shift. And it may feel something like ecstasy or bliss. The more you become conscious of your light body, the more you exist in a state of bliss and ecstasy all the time. It becomes your new normal. So just allow yourself to be in that space to whatever degree you're experiencing it. A reminder once again that any effort from the ego to control or help this process will just slow it down. Your only job is to stay wherever you're breathing. Keep the ego occupied with the breath. <coughs> Leave maximum space for spirit to do what you called it to do. Each time you note a distraction, simply return to breath awareness. Whoa. Hmm. Now you may be aware of a pull from your higher self to join with it consciously, which sets us up for the next invocation. Let me preview it for you. Spirit, please make me one with my higher self to the greatest extent that serves the highest good right now. Thank you. If you're willing to say that one, then please repeat after me. Spirit, Spirit please make me one with my higher self to the greatest extent that serves the highest good right now. Thank you. Okay, back to your breath. Just allow the process to run itself. Everything is happening automatically here. Because we're only asking for things to the greatest extent that serves the highest good, you will never be overwhelmed. You will never be too intense. Your boundary may get pushed a bit, but you will not feel like it's too much. You are safe when you invoke with this language. Mm -hmm. What does the breath feel like coming in? What does the breath feel like going out? Make your breath your whole universe. Okay, you may be feeling a vibrational shift right now. If you have an awareness of that divine part of you blending with you, just allow that to happen. As the blending occurs, it feels different. There's a vibrational shift. Don't try to describe it in your mind. There are no words for it. Just allow it to be an experience. We're way beyond mental description here. You can experience it, but you can't describe it. Nice. Check in again, what's your light body percentage? Return to your breathing. 
The breath is the engine that drives this process. Even as you're joining with your higher self, there is a part of you still aware of your physical body and its breath. Some part of you will remain with that so that this process can keep moving forward. And you might give another number, 1 to 10 on the bliss scale, your blissometer. 1 would be, ain't got no bliss at all. 10 would be, I can't imagine it getting any more blissful than this. Just put a number on that. How blissful is it right now? Hmm. Back to the breath. Mm -hmm. Allow yourself to be dissolved into something different. If you feel that dissolution happening, just allow it. What you are cannot be destroyed. You can just feel different in various dimensions. <sighs> Lovely. Now you may notice that we're starting to become aware of the physical body a little bit more now. We're now entering the integration process. The invocation for this is as follows. Spirit, please integrate my light body and my physical body to the greatest extent that serves the highest good right now. Thank you. If you're willing to say that one, then please repeat after me. Spirit, Amen. please integrate my light body and my physical body to the greatest extent that serves the highest good right now. Thank you. Same drill as always. Be aware of your breathing. Please make no effort to assist. It will be counterproductive. Just stay with your breathing. Nice. You may be feeling a tingling throughout your body. If so, this is the feeling of the light body integrating into the physical. Every cell is being penetrated by its energetic equivalent. So just be with your breath, allow it to happen. It may feel kind of intense, but again, it won't go over the top. Just allow it to come in. You may feel releases happening in various chakras or parts of the body. That's just some of the dark stuff you've been carrying around getting pushed out to make room for the light. So if challenging thoughts or emotions are arising and as this process moves forward, just allow it. Your gig is always the same. Just stay with your breathing. Let everything else happen spontaneously and automatically. Just relax and allow. Your higher self has everything under control here. It knows exactly what it's doing. <sighs> okay, now you may feel like that integration is, is a little more complete, so let's ask the following questions and answer them to yourself. Do you feel your light body? Do you feel your physical body? Can you feel them both at the same time? And do they feel integrated? that you have the choice of where to place your attention. If there is a distraction, you can always choose to return to your breathing no matter what the distraction is. You can train yourself to do it. Mm -hmm. All right.
right, so now that you have some level of physical, uh, spiritual integration, we're going to call for, if you wish, the placement of primary awareness into the light body. The downstream consequences, if you do this, is that your main awareness is the light part of yourself. You relate to the ego and the body as the car you're driving around, a very useful and important tool, but it's not you. You are also free to travel through other dimensions anytime you want and come and go from the body as you please. So if you would like to have that shift, then please repeat after me. I'll, I'll preview the invocation. It's spirit, please place my primary awareness in my light body to the greatest extent, etc. The usual language that follows. So if you would like to do that, then repeat after me. Spirit, spirit. please place my primary awareness, please place my primary awareness. Into, my into my light body to the greatest extent that serves the highest good, the highest good. Right, now. right now. Thank you. Thank you. Same drill as always, just be with your breath, let the process run itself. Hmm. And you can feel what a different kind of energy that brings in when you call for that. There are an infinite numbers of bliss flavors. Hmm. And you get to sample lots of them when you do this kind of work. And finally, we'll close with an invocation that's for practical purposes. It will go as follows. Spirit, please grant me the maximum physical coordination as I drive this physical body around to the greatest extent, etc. So let's try that one on if you like. Spirit, Spirit. please grant me the maximum physical coordination, the maximum physical coordination. That, serves the highest good. that serves the highest good as I drive this physical body around. As I drive this physical body around. Thank, you. Thank you. Back to your breath. And when you're ready, open your eyes. And when you're ready, move your body just a little bit, an arm or something, and see if it feels really different now, the way your body is moving than it did before. If there's more to it, higher sensitivity, stuff like that. Anyone feel different now? <laughs> yeah. Okay, let me give you some closing comments on this. And we did all that in about 12 minutes, by the way. It doesn't have to take a long time. Maybe 15. Okay. So, ah. Uh, so if you have had the experience, then you are feeling different now. And it's because you are more of a conscious being of light. Let me just ask, does anyone feel more like a light being now? If so, raise your hand. Okay, quite a few of you, good. Okay, the other of you just aren't quite ready to raise your hand yet, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so this will not last for most of you. Okay, it will start to fade over time. The ego wants its control back, all right? So you have to keep re-invoking it. So the, the simplest invocation is just spirit, the very first one we did. Spirit, please grant me the maximum awareness of my light body that serves the highest good right now. Thank you. Just keep calling that back when, you, when the energy starts to fade and it will come right back just like that. Okay? Um, the ego also will try to get you to forget this is possible. That's its most powerful tool, just forgetfulness that you can even do this. So give yourself reminders. Put something up on your note or you have your computer pop it up. Got light body? You know? <laughs> Whatever, you know, something to remind you so that there is some kind of reminder in your physical world to do this. All right. Again, the, the website, uh, I have numerous articles that describe this process. If you go to itsallgoodastrology.com, my site, go to the articles page. The very first series of links on that page is what's called the Ask and Receive series, and there's a whole <laughs> bunch of articles on how to do this. The very first linked article at the end of it has a link to a recording you can download an mp3 that does what we just did but it does in about 30 minutes the same sequence of six invocations and you may find listening to that and being guided by it may be helpful okay and this recording this video and this audio are going to go up on the web too within a few weeks and it'll be available there on my site as well um, any questions about any of this The last thing I want to do, and, and we're only about three after nine, so we're doing pretty good, is how to send light to others. Okay, so um, 
Think of the person you have great love for, who is easy to love, all right? And you're going to send light to that person. You're not going to use your hands. None of this. Just leave your hands where they are, all right? The, the energy will find a way. I want you to show how to do this stealthily. Right? <laughs> Stealth. Spirituality, all right? So uh, the, the invocation will be, Spirit, please flow the light through me to serve name of person's highest good right now. Thank you. So just to think of the person you're going to do it for, and then when we get to the name part, just say the name out loud and, and move on. So let's try it now. So close your eyes. Repeat after me. Spirit, Spirit please, flow the light through me please flow the light through me to serve this person's highest good. Right now. Thank you. Okay, now just, you're just piped now. It's all just going through you. Just relax and breathe. Make no further effort. Don't visualize the person. Don't use words. Just chill and breathe. Nice. So what you may be experiencing is that light is flowing from the front of your body somewhere, usually the heart, out to that person, and you can feel it going through you. You may also notice that you're feeling different because the energy that's coming through you is also going in full measure to you as well as to them. What you give, you receive instantly when you do this. So take a moment longer to experience that. Okay, open your eyes. Did you all feel how your energy shifted when you sent? You could feel it go into them and it would come into you as well? Okay, and you can send to multiples. I'm going to send to all of you at the same moment. So you can actually send everyone on the planet at the same time. It'll just do the room. Okay, so just relax and close your eyes and feel this. Spirit, please flow the energy through me to serve the highest good of each person in this room right now. Thank you. Hmm. Here it goes. Those of you with psychic vision can see that there are rays of light flowing from me to each person in the room, and it's all happening on autopilot. I'm just breathing. Spirit does it all. See if you can feel the energy of it. Okay, you can open your eyes. Did y'all feel that? Okay, spirit can do anything. The cool thing about invocation is you don't need any technical knowledge. You don't have to develop expertise in moving energy around. You call for the end result, and spirit handles all the details. It's very cool. It's something that anyone can do anytime. So again, you, there's, on the website, I, I show how to create your own invocations for your own use. So if at any moment you've got some kind of energetic shift you want to create in yourself, then just invoke it, breathe, and it comes. And this, I don't know if this was possible before this golden age shifted, but I sure know it's possible now. And I've done this with hundreds of clients and groups, and I've only had one or two people who couldn't do it. It's like almost universally available. So this is a very powerful tool. Put it in your spiritual toolkit if you find it helpful. If you find something that works better, toss this out and use what works better. Always use the best available technique. Um, so again, the, the website has lots more resources on this, and in my newsletter I frequently write new articles about this, so that's one nice thing about getting the newsletter, you get my latest you know, invocation thing. So are there any questions or comments before we close? You're welcome. All right, and again, if anyone would like to do work with me privately, you can talk to me after we break up here, or you can call me later with the card or whatever you're up to. So it's been a great privilege to do this tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Are you going to draw me winner? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I totally forgot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that. <laughs> ah, thank you. <coughs> And uh, would you like to be the drawer? What if I pull my own name? Then you win. <laughs> Are you that good? <laughs> find out. So what we got? We have Sean Hill. Is that you? Awesome. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. So you get the free session. Congratulations. And, uh, and thank you all so much for being here. I'm, I will hang out for a while, so I'm, you're welcome to chat with me or ask me your whatever you want to do. Thanks so much. Good night.
Thank you.